16 years from today, Greg Gerstner will finally land the perfect cannonball. Epic Splash. Unsuspecting friends. A work of art only possible because Greg is already meeting all these same people at AARP volunteer and community events that keep him active and involved and help make sure his happiness lives as long as he does. That's why the younger you are, the more you need AARP. Learn more at aarp.org slash local. Curious about how you can achieve smooth, natural-looking, long-lasting filler results? The Juvederm Collection of Fillers has six unique gel fillers that add subtle volume and are designed for different needs in specific areas of the face, like lips, cheeks, chin, smile lines, under eyes, and jawline. Ask your licensed specialist for a full face assessment today and download the Alley app. That's A-L-L-E, the official loyalty program of Juvederm, to save on treatments and get a look that's true to you. For important safety information and to find a licensed specialist, visit Juvederm.com. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Not for people with severe allergic reactions, allergies to lidocaine, or the proteins used in Juvederm. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. There's a risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel, which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. Talk to a licensed specialist to find out if it's right for you. Hello and welcome to History for Weirdos. We are your hosts, Andrew and Stephanie. And each week, we're going to take you on a journey into the strange, obscure, and relentlessly entertaining corners of human history. Now listen up, friends, because it's about to get weird. Weirdos, welcome back to another episode of History for Weirdos. We are really happy to be back because we didn't have a new episode come out last week because we both had the flu. Yes. Like full-blown flu, a week of like fever, coughing, runny nose. I still have the coughing and runny nose going on, but no more delirium. So that's a good thing. Yes, we were not well. I was walking around and like... Uh, a, like a Victorian nightgown <laughs> yes, like and literally. like 60 sunglasses because the light was hurting my eyes. So I was like psychedelic and spooky. Oh yeah. You were just like out of it. Oh yeah. I had like a 101 like fever for days for days. We could have yeah. it down. Yeah. And then, and then I was just delirious. I was seeing things that weren't there. So we could not have done this episode or the last week's episode. Nope. We couldn't have. Um, and we survived it, thankfully. Yay! Here's a reminder to get your flu shots. Seriously. We definitely will be doing that moving forward. Yeah, I think next year. Next yeah. year, for sure. I think this was our flu shot for now. Yeah. And before we jump into this week's spooky episode, we do have a pretty big announcement. We do have a very big announcement. So we'll be taking an indefinite hiatus um, starting next week. And the, the big reason for this is that, honestly, guys, we're just burned out. Yeah, we're going to be real with the weirdos because we really love and appreciate this community. Yeah. And we just want to be honest and share that we're a little burnt out right now. We're pretty burnt out. <laughs> yeah. We have our, our jobs, obviously, as well. And, and there's just a lot on our plates right now. So we're going to take a hiatus. As Andrew mentioned, we don't know how long it'll be, but we want to take a step back to see what is needed moving forward for us to create the level of quality that we really want to create for you all. Right. Cause if we continued, I think at this pace, you would start to see like a noticeable decline in quality and we just don't want to put out anything that isn't, you know, something that we're proud of. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so we really love the weirdos. We want to thank you all for all the support and encouragement over how many years? I mean, we've, uh, we've three been consistent years? for like, yeah, since 2021, like fall 2021. So three years. Yeah. And, um, we don't ever want you all to think we don't appreciate that. It's, yeah, it's us. It's not you, yeah. <laughs> but actually, <laughs> but actually we just need to figure out how to decompress. You know, it's so funny is we have our dog Pericles in dog school 
And the big feedback that his trainer gave us was that he doesn't know how to relax yeah. and decompress and give himself a break. And we're just standing there nodding, both knowing that he gets that from us for <laughs> sure. We're like, oh, I wonder why that is. Yeah, no, it's definitely from us. It's definitely from us. So this is us taking a break. If you would like to know, like stay in touch with us, basically, like keep up to date with our comings and goings. I really suggest following us on Instagram. That's where we'll still like post on stories or if we do, you know, like a trip or we go to a museum or something, we'll keep you all updated. Right. We'll keep sharing pictures of Perry on there. So follow us at History for Weirdos if you aren't doing so already. And that is probably, you know, where we would announce if... Um, new content's coming out. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. Yeah. Well, that was the big news that we wanted to drop. And this, you know, this will be the last episode of 2024. So mm -hmm. we wanted to, you know, be very upfront with that. And hopefully it's a good one. Hopefully. Yes. I think it is. We'll see. I mean, I know what you're going to talk about, so I think it'll be a good one. Well, weirdos, let me jump right in. Oh yeah. It's 1843. And there's a young maid named Grace Marks. She gets caught up in a murder scandal. A murder. In Canada. And she's accused of killing her boss and his housekeeper. But no one's really sure if she did it or not. It's a huge mystery and gossip spreads like wildfire. Oh, snap. This sounds like the perfect like episode to end 2024 on. Yeah. Fast forward to the 90s, the 1990s. Oh, wow. So like 150 years later. Yep. Okay. And a possibly well-known author, Margaret Atwood. Mm, I've heard of her. She wrote this now famous book called Alias Grace. And her book is all about the story of this young maid, Grace Marks, and what may have happened. And a few years ago, they even turned this book into a show that's now on Netflix. Yes, which we have seen called Alias Grace. I recommend it, would you? Oh, absolutely. I it, think we recommended it actually when we were watching it. I think we did. It's an incredible story, and today we're going to be taking a closer look at the peculiar and mysterious case of Miss Grace Marks. Excellent. So, let's talk a little bit about her early life, the things we know. Obviously, um, well, not obviously, but she's, she's of lower socioeconomic status, so we don't have a ton of information about her beginnings. But we know that she was born around 1828 in Ulster, Ireland. This would be in Northern Ireland. To an impoverished and unfortunately abusive father with alcoholism. She was one of eight children. Oh my God. And in 1840, at the age of 12, she immigrated to Canada with her family from Ireland. I feel like having three kids now would be like, that's a lot of kids. Let alone eight. Eight. <sighs> yeah. Wow. My, how, how many is my dad? Five or six? Yeah, something like, something like that. And then your <laughs> my mom's, mom's nine. Like nine, yeah. One of nine. And then I think my all of my grandparents are like one of a dozen. It's insane. Yeah, it is. I can't imagine. We're, yeah. We have our hands full with Perry. <laughs> I know, a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so the family, you know, in search of a better life, they endure a difficult six-week journey aboard a very crowded and very unsanitary coffin ship, as they become known as. I'll get into the coffin ships in a moment. Okay. Uh, while on this journey, unfortunately, tragedy strikes Grace's family because her mom becomes ill and she dies on the voyage. Oh, my gosh. So upon arriving to Canada, she is a child. She's an immigrant. She has seven siblings to look after. And an abusive dad who ends up drinking away the little bit of money that they make. Well, that sounds fun. Yeah, exactly. So let me get into the coffin ships a little bit. This is actually something someone... Oh, and I'm so sorry, I can't recall your name. Because I saw this message a long time ago. Someone wrote to us saying that we should do an episode on the coffin ships. And if you are of Irish descent in the Americas probably familiar with the term the coffin ships is used to describe the ships that carried irish immigrants to north america especially in the 1840s and i want to share a little bit more about them to provide context for the world that 
brought grace marks into Canada. Yeah, please. So they were known for overcrowding and unsanitary conditions. And the term coffin ship conveys the dangerous nature of the voyage. A lot of people died on these ships. Um, that's a, that shows how desperate I think people were to immigrate. Oh, and this was also because of the, the famine, <clears throat> right? This might be pre famine. I'm not sure. We should no. know that. Yeah. It's around that it's, time. Right. Um, there, are, there are a few different surges of immigration from Ireland, and it is because of the um, oppressive involvement of the British government in Ireland right. that then reduces resources for Irish people, sends them over here to North America. These ships were initially designed for cargo transport, so these are not ships that were even made for human beings. Oh, wow. Okay, so they're coffin because they're cramped and people die on them. Yes. Great. Um, they repurpose these cargo ships because they're like, ah, these are low-income, poor immigrants. Who cares? Just cram as many as you can in there. So I feel like some... There's still, like, businesses today that, like, operate like that. It's very corporate America of them. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That used to all the words straight from my mouth. The, the ships are also because, again, they're not built for humans. They don't have ventilation, really. And there's no um, designated bathrooms or sanitary spaces. So people are going to the bathroom in buckets well around each other and there's no fresh air coming in or out so if one person gets sick that's going to spread like wildfire and you're very likely to get sick with uh urine and feces around oh you oh god that sounds disgusting yeah they're obviously known for lots of disease and death um they were particularly known for carrying typhus dysentery and cholera um those are all very serious. Very serious. Basically, if you were to catch one of these diseases while on a coffin ship, it was almost like a death sentence. Wow. There was no medic that was there to like make you get better, make sure you crossed. It was just, oh, she's sick. She's probably going to die. Yeah. You know, move on. Yeah. Unbelievable. The traumatic experience of traveling on a coffin ship and witnessing so much illness and death, as well as enduring weeks of deprivation of sun fresh air fresh food would have had a profound and long-lasting psychological impact on the passengers oh i can absolutely imagine that i think surviving a coffin ship journey would qualify as a traumatic event um, and it's also an example of generational trauma because there's a whole generation of people who went through this at, and a lot of them in childhood yeah and i think this really contextualizes again where grace marks is coming from um, I, th I thought it was really interesting when I was researching the coffin ships that someone described them as a symbol of desperation, that they represent the desperation that drove many Irish families to leave their homeland. Again, mm. you have to be pretty hungry in every sense of the word to be willing to board a ship known as a coffin ship yeah, with absolutely. your children. I mean, the risks are insane. Mm -hmm. Historians estimate that up to 100,000 people died. On these oh coffin my. ships. Jesus, they really like didn't care. Very high mortality rates to get yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. God. So Grace and her family mainly survived that. She unfortunately loses her mom, as we mentioned. And she's in Canada. Her role would be to earn money to take care of her father and her siblings, even though she's a child herself. Right, because her father's a drunk and, like, her siblings are too young. Yeah. In 1843, at 16, Grace is employed as a housemaid in the home of a man named Thomas Kinnear. He is a wealthy Scottish-Canadian farmer. She works alongside another servant, James McDermott, and a housekeeper named Nancy Montgomery. That's the whole staff. It's those three folks in the house. Okay. And even though it's a small staff, tensions are very high in the household. McDermott, this is the male staff member, he clashed a lot with Montgomery, the head of the home, over his work performance. And she was apparently, allegedly, I should say, because we don't know for sure, very abusive, constantly threatening she was going to fire him. 
she definitely um, had a position of power within the house. And you may ask why. Why does the head maid have so much power? It's because people believe she was Kinnear's lover. Mm. That they were in a romantic relationship. And she functioned basically as the lady of the house, even though they weren't married. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So she treated, allegedly again, Grace and um, Kinnear like servants. And she was also supposed to be a servant, but she was definitely elevated above them. Yeah. So just three weeks after Grace starts working there at the Kinnear residence, both Thomas, Thomas Kinnear, is that what I said his first name was? Yes. Yeah, Thomas, yeah. Uh-huh. I was like, was I just thinking of my dad? No. <laughs> Thomas Kinnear and Miss Montgomery are found murdered. Oh. Not even a month into Grace's employment. Wow. So Kinnear had been shot and Montgomery was found in the cellar, having been struck with an axe and strangled. Okay. Pretty violent deaths. Very violent. Grace and McDermott, the other servant, were nowhere to be found and several valuables in the home were missing when the remains were discovered. An article from Smithsonian Magazine described the scene as follows, quote, The lovers' bodies were found in a cellar. Thomas Kinnear, the owner of the home, had been shot in the left side of his chest. Nancy Montgomery, his housekeeper, was struck in the head with an axe and strangled. Her body was discovered crammed beneath a tub. An autopsy would later reveal that Montgomery had been pregnant when her life came to an abrupt end. Oh, no. Wow. Which further provides for, you know, the spectators, the people... Trying to guess what happened here. That's further evidence that they were lovers. Right. Is that she's pregnant and there's no other men in her life that we know of. Yeah. We didn't have DNA analysis like then. So we couldn't like say, but probably. That would have been really helpful in this situation. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. And before I get into the case a little bit further, I want to talk a little bit about how Grace marks her identity as an Irish immigrant would have influenced the public perception of this case. Okay. So actually it's not just Grace. Both Grace Marks and James McDermott are Irish immigrants. Okay. Grace Marks happens to be Protestant and uh, McDermott happens to be Catholic, but the Protestantism doesn't really shield Grace from a lot of the discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. That's something that you would discover about someone once you get to know them. Right. Right. But you look at someone and hear the way someone talks. That's where your prejudice is going to come in. Yeah. Um, So this would have been really significant. It's not significant to us. But for 19th century Canada, Irish immigrants faced a lot of prejudice and discrimination. And there were a lot of stereotypes of Irish people that would have influenced this case. For example, it was believed that Irish people were more violent. They were more hypersexual. And they were more prone to insanity compared to their other Western European immigrant counterparts. Very interesting. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. So when we're looking at this case, the sources really emphasize Grace's appearance and demeanor during the trial. She's described as good looking, but she appears uneducated. She appears devoid of expression. Um, They write about her that she's wearing clothes stolen from Nancy Montgomery, even though we don't know if that's true. We don't know if the clothes were Montgomery's or not. But again, kind of feeding into that stereotype of she's a thief, she's dumb, things like that. Right. Um, Basically, a lot of the portrayals depict this image of what was a stereotype back then as a wild Irish girl lacking a lot of morals, lacking refinement. Mm -hmm. So again, that doesn't exist as much today by any means. So I just wanted to give that context. As you can imagine, people in Canada went wild over this case. I can imagine. Yeah. Cause this would be an insane story today. Right. Let alone back then when people were so closed off to talking about these taboo subjects. Right. So this has everything. It has violence. It has sex. It has the uprising of the servant class. (laughs) 
It has immigrants, like all of these high tension topics. It's hitting all those, it's checking all those boxes. <laughs> exactly. So we last left off where the remains are found. It's noted that things are missing from the home and the two other servants aren't there. Well, McDermott and Marx are apprehended in Lewiston, New York. Oh, wow. So they made it all the way across the border. They made it all the way across the border. Um, and Canadian newspapers could not get enough of this case and this trial. There were articles published across the country, actually both in Canada and the United States, um, to try to keep the whole public informed of what was happening in this little region of West Canada. Right. When we get into the accounts of what happened, I'm just going to preface we don't really know what's real and what's not oh, okay it's because there's so much speculation that it's like hard to separate fact from fiction yes marx and mcdermott are going to give us very different versions of what happened leading up to the murder and the murder itself which then only fuels more media attention which then only fuels more public speculation grace marx's confession are you ready i'm ready let's hear it <clears throat> so she gave actually three different confessions <laughs> and they all conflicted with each other. Oh, man, poor girl. Oh my gosh. But I think she's like, she's 16. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it could not even be like she's doing something shady. It could just be that. Yeah. Like she's 16 and she's she 16 she's and she's scattered. terrified yeah. and scattered and doesn't have anyone. I like, I couldn't find any sources saying that her dad showed up at all. Wow. So she doesn't have anyone guiding her in this. Even though she's been sending her dad money, he's not coming to her when <sighs> she's in trouble. Of course. Mm -hmm. So she gives multiple conflicting accounts, as does Kinnear. Um, but we, we base her confession off the last confession that she gave, uh, where there's a transcript of it. Okay. In it, she stated that it's very long, so I'm going to summarize. Fair. That the first two weeks of her employment... She frequently witnessed Montgomery chastising McDermott for doing poor work, right? That's the first thing she notices. These two don't get along. After two weeks, Montgomery gave McDermott a two-week notice that once the month was up, he was going to be given his wages and he had to leave. Mm. Marx said that McDermott was actually not upset when he got fired, Um and he said to her, allegedly, quote, he would get his satisfaction before he left. Interesting. Okay. So, you want to be a marketer. It's easy. You just have to score a ton of leads and figure out a way to turn them all into customers. Plus, manage a dozen channels, write a million blogs, and launch a hundred campaigns all at once. When that's done, simply make your socials go viral and bring in record profits. No sweat. Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. But with HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools, launching benchmark-breaking campaigns is easier than ever. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. Whether you're making a delicious family meal or a post-workout snack, choose the farm-fresh taste of Eggland's best eggs. Only Eggland's best hens are fed their proprietary all-vegetarian feed. That's what makes their eggs more nutritious. With 10 times more vitamin E, 25% less saturated fat, and six times more vitamin D compared to ordinary eggs. Eggland's Best. Better taste, better nutrition, better eggs. Visit egglandsbest.com to learn more. Imagine what's possible when learning doesn't get in the way of life. At Capella University, our game-changing FlexPath learning format lets you set your own deadline so you can learn at a time and pace that works for you. It's an education you can tailor to your schedule. That means you don't have to put your life on hold to pursue your professional goals. Instead, enjoy learning your way and earn your degree without missing a beat. A different future is closer than you think with Capella University. Learn more at capella.edu. Um, Marx and McDermott are talking about Montgomery and why she behaves the way she does, why she sort of bosses them around and talks down to them. And Marx is able to confirm to McDermott that Montgomery is sleeping with Kinnear. So that's a lot of names. Yeah. So Grace tells the other Irish guy, this head maid, she's definitely sleeping with our boss because um, whenever part of Grace's job was to like clean all the rooms and 
Nancy never slept in her bed. So where is she, where is she sleeping? Yeah, that's that's <laughs> actually that's pretty good deduction. Yeah, she's like, hmm, think about it. Um, and McDermott's like, oh snap, that's some good tea. I have a secret too. Can I tell you the secret? And you promise not to tell anyone. And she's a sixteen year old girl, so she's like, like yeah. yeah, tell me what the secret is. <laughs> so he says. That he knows that their boss, Thomas Kinnear, is going to go into the city soon. Because they're in like a farming town. Mm -hmm. And he said, when he's gone, I'm going to kill Nancy. Oh, my God. And when he comes back, as soon as he's like pulling up in the wagon, I'm going to shoot him. (laughs) And then I'm going to steal all their shit. And I'm going to go to the United States. This is what Grace says that he confessed to her, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and grace gives different accounts of she didn't want him to know basically like oh shit like you shouldn't do that she was kind of doing a little bit of the fawning thing of like oh really like huh so interesting they definitely have it coming to them but she reports that she kept trying to delay him killing them right as she was trying to figure out what to do um she gives interesting th- like reasons in her confessions as to why she's delaying him. She's like, Oh, well you can't go kill Nancy right now because she's in my room. And then it's, there's going to be blood everywhere. And he's like, yeah, you're right. I don't want you to have to clean that up. But when people are listening to that part of her own confession, they're interpreting it as she's, they don't have this word, but basically like a sociopath. Mm. Like, why is that what you're thinking of when he's about to murder two people? Right. Exactly. But she's arguing like, no, I was just kind of pulling stuff out of my butt to like delay this from happening until the boss got home. Yeah. That's smart. Mm-hmm. Which I, I kind of believe I could see that happening. Um, and then Grace says that obviously he, he kills them both as he planned. Mm-hmm. He kills Nancy. And then as soon as, um, their boss pulls up, he shoots him just like he said he would. And he threatens grace. She tries to run away and he shoots at her. He doesn't hit her, but he shoots in her direction and he makes her come with him to the United States. He makes her take essentially the loot and leave with him. So she reports basically that she's kind of captive, right? Um, and she finishes by saying how the two arrived in New York for the night. They ate. They went to separate rooms. She makes that very clear because the public at this point believes that they are lovers and that they planned this together. But she's like, no, you could check. Like, we booked two rooms. And at, like, five in the morning, um, you know, someone stormed into my room and arrested me. So that's her story, that she didn't have anything to do with it basically she was like kind of a coerced unwilling participant that's a really good way of putting it Mm -hmm. but mcdermott has a different story of course oh yeah as i mentioned he was also born in ireland he had been living in canada for six years at this point and he worked a few different jobs before coming to the Kinnear residence he was um, a waiter on a steamboat He even served time in the provincial military. And he explained how when he came to work for um, Kinnear, Marx arrived only a week later. Mm. So there was no one, there was no staff, and then all of a sudden they needed people. So he gets hired a week later, Grace gets hired, which he thought was odd that it was like a big home and there was no one working there. Yeah, that is strange. So he claims that Grace is the one who instigated the murders. Ooh. Yeah, very different. He says that Grace was really angry at how Nancy was treating them, that it wasn't fair, and it wasn't fair that just because she was sleeping with the boss, she got better treatment. Right. And then he says that when he's given his two weeks notice, that's when she approaches him about killing them. That she takes that opportunity of him being really like, oh, shoot, like, what am I going to do? And she's like, we need to kill them and we need to get what's ours. McDermott's confession repeatedly states that he he's like, I refused. Every time she brought it up, I told her no. But then obviously he eventually agrees. Right, exactly. Because he shoots (laughs) Kinnear. Yeah, so. 
And when asked about that in his confession, like, okay, homie, but mm, two people were dead. So obviously you did something. He said, quote, I will not say how Mr. Kinnear and how Nancy Montgomery were killed, but I should not have done it if I had not been urged to do so by Grace Marks. Grace Marks is wrong in stating she had no hand in the murder. She was the means of it from beginning to end. So he's saying that like he, yeah, he was the instrument, quote unquote, but yes. she was the mastermind. Yes, exactly. Very interesting. I also think it's interesting that he doesn't want to share the details of how he killed them. Yeah, that's odd. Because he's not denying he killed them. But he's like, I'm not going to tell you how, but it's like, well, we saw the bodies, so mm-hmm. we can kind of like, we, we kind of understand. We know. Yeah, yeah, we know what happened. Um, so those are their confessions. They confess before going to trial. So McDermott's trial takes place on Friday the 3rd, November 1843. And the report of that day states that, quote, the courthouse was occupied with such an immense crowd anxious to witness the proceedings in this case of extreme atrocity and such has never before stained the records of the judiciary courts of this colony. Wow. So it is packed. Yeah. With spectators. Everyone is scandalized, but it's kind of like the train wreck thing where they're like, I cannot look away. McDermott is described as being, quote, a slim made man, apparently about one or two and 20 years of age. So he's either 21 or 22. About middle height with a rather swarthy complexion and a sullen, downcast and forbidding countenance. I love the way that people used to write back then. Yeah, I don't know what a swarthy complexion is, do you? No, no idea. Well, there you go. Let us know, weirdos. Let us know. (laughs) Well, Marx was described as, quote, rather good looking. Oh. That is noted in multiple sources that she's pretty. Which I'm like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, they're like, she's pretty. I'm like, why are you talking about that? Also a 16-year-old girl, but okay. Why are you commenting on this if you think the 16-year-old's a murderess? Um, so rather good looking. Otherwise, again, she looks totally uneducated. Her countenance is devoid of expression. They're almost saying she looks kind of dumb and slow. Mm. So they don't describe her as like devoid of expression in a heartless way, but more in like, um, like she's dim. Wow. Mm -hmm. So they both Despite their confessions, they both enter pleas of not guilty. Okay. And they are tried separately. So it's two separate cases at this point. One of the key witnesses to testify was James Walsh. He is a neighbor. And by neighbor, I mean like he lives in another farm. So not close enough to have heard what happened, but he was often at the Kinnear residence. Right. He lived like a few miles down the road or something. Right. So he had been at the house the night before the murders. Wow. Okay. With um, Kinnear was gone. He was in the city and he was hanging out with Nancy, Grace and McDermott. And he, w- he said like, I was playing some music. We were hanging out and we were having like a really good night. Like it was really calm. Nothing seemed suspicious. And he leaves the home around 10 p.m. McDermott's like, I don't want you walking alone. Let me walk you home. I don't know if he had something to drink or why, but McDermott walks him home at like 10 p.m. And then on Saturday, the neighbor Walsh, James Walsh, comes back to the residence to be like, oh my God, wasn't that such a great night? And he notices that McDermott is holding a shotgun in the front of the house. And he's like, what are you doing? And McDermott's (laughs) like, oh, I was shooting birds. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> why was that a, an acceptable response i don't know shooting birds oh my god man and then according to walsh he saw grace come out of the house and he said that the dress she was wearing was definitely nancy montgomery's because it was much nicer than the dresses she normally wore Ooh. so that's what he walks in on grace is dressed like nancy mcdermott's shooting birds allegedly that's a great, like, a great alibi. Yeah. Or a great excuse. It's not even an <laughs> alibi. It's just, like, an excuse. There are lots of other witnesses that testify, but I didn't include them because no one really was able to testify 
anything close to the events. It was more like character witnesses. Mm. Um, Walsh is the closest we get to the timeline of the murders from this outside perspective. So the jury hear everything. And after only 10 minutes of deliberation, McDermott's guilty. Yeah. And I'm not surprised. 10 minutes. This poor young, um, Irish immigrant servant who says he was shooting birds. Yeah. No way. Yeah. He's he's done. (laughs) He's done. 10 minute deliberation. That is very quick. (laughs) No sympathy there. All that could be said of McDermott when he's, when they announce the guilty verdict is that he is so apathetic that people could hardly believe it. Like, did he hear? Did he like hear what he they just said? Like, it was almost like, oh yeah, they're, that, that's like a green swallow or whatever, speaking of birds. He didn't react. Wow. He's just sitting there like, okay. Also, I don't think green swallows are real, but... That would be pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> so then, Marx's trial technically occurs the next day, but the, there's nothing particularly of note. The witness statements, which I think is funny given during McDermott's trial, mm-hmm. we're just like, okay, so just remember all of that for Grace's trial. We're not going to do it again because we just did it yesterday. <laughs> the holiday season officially starts when you get that first card in the mail. Shutterfly makes it easy to add more meaning to the everyday with hundreds of holiday card designs that can be personalized in seconds with your favorite photos from this year. Select your greeting, customize the color, and even add little extras like personalized foil to make a holiday card that really shines. Enjoy 40% off with code SMILE40 at Shutterfly.com and send something meaningful this year. See site for more details. Hablas español? Sprichst du Deutsch? Komm du noch? If you've heard that sound from Babbel before, I bet you do. Babbel is the science-backed language learning app that actually works. With quick 10-minute lessons handcrafted by over 200 language experts, Babbel gets you on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. With over 16 million subscriptions sold and a 20-day money-back guarantee, just start speaking another language with Babbel. Right now, up to 55% off your Babbel subscription at babbel.com slash Spotify podcast. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash Spotify podcast. Rules and restrictions may apply. Oh, okay. The only things that were added were witnesses again coming to speak on Grace's character, like previous employers, friends that knew her. Mm-hmm. And they all said that she was agreeable and kind. And nobody had anything bad to say about her. There was nothing weird or suspicious that anyone had ever picked up on. So this trial is much shorter. And again, after only a few minutes, the jury's like, yeah, she's guilty too. <laughs> It's not funny, but like, I just can't help but laugh at like kind of the absurdity of it all. The proceedings to us, you know, from our modern lens also seem very unprofessional. It sounds so insanely unprofessional and like you could easily just be like, yeah, that's, uh, that's a mistrial right there. It's almost like most of the evidence is public opinion at this point. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. So that's why we're laughing. Not because it's funny. Um, so they are both sentenced to death but when it came to grace the jury did recommend mercy on the prisoner probably because she was a woman and a young woman at that right so they're both scheduled to hang but then the judge is like actually i'm just gonna uh, send grace to life in prison i changed my mind he does take the consideration of mercy on the prisoner but they do hang mcdermott yes And I'll get to that actually in a moment. Okay. So again, Marx is sentenced to life in prison. She's sentenced to Kingston Penitentiary from 1843 to 1872. And she, this also includes a year at the provincial asylum. And that is where we have a lot of accounts from grace on her life and what was going on in the Kinnear home. This woman who was writing a book who was a journalist her name her last name was moody Mm -hmm. she went um, multiple times to interview grace and then in 1872 she's pardoned oh wow she is given time served and she moves to the united states i mean yeah that's like 30 years so yeah for yeah and she was 16 when she went in yeah so she's like almost 40 now yeah i mean sorry almost 50 yeah full-blown adult Um, And then after she moves to the United States, she vanishes from the historical records. We don't know anything about what happens to her. I wonder if she just changed her name and she just like dipped. That's a really good guess. Yeah. Just changed her name and started over. 
But going back a little bit, before McDermott is hanged, one of his last words is that Grace Marx was, quote, an evil genius who mastermind a double murder, then feigned mental illness in order to avoid the gallows, end quote. Whoa. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Because again, he insists that he was, like you said, her tool. Yeah, and so and he, it sounded like he was consistent with that until the very end. Mm-hmm. As you can imagine, this story has had quite an impact on pop culture. Um, most notably, the novel I mentioned at the beginning, Margaret Atwood's 1996 Alias Grace. I really want to read the book after watching the show because Atwood heard about the case. She actually read one of Moody's accounts, that woman who went to go visit her, and she was like, what? This is nuts. Why are there so many conflicting narratives surrounding this story? And she could see from a modern lens how there were a lot of uh, societal prejudices against these two that definitely influenced the case. So she took all the sources she could get and she wrote a fictionalized version of what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And then she adds in um, characters like the character of Dr. Simon Jordan. Yes, which we see in the TV show. And he is intentionally used to explore Grace's psyche and the complexities of the case. Essentially, she gives us Dr. Simon Jordan to explore if what McDermott says is true. Is she an evil genius? Right. Like, and I could see that, like, I mean, she had a really, really tough childhood Mm -hmm. and maybe like the only way, like, because of that, she like maybe developed like a personality disorder or something. You think it's like a trauma response? Yeah. And then she just, she would have seen who she is. She would have seen a lot of, um, death, violence and hardship at only 16. Yeah. A lot of it. So she could have been desensitized to it also. Yeah. We don't want to give anything away. Right. In terms of what happens or what doesn't happen. Like in the TV show? Yeah. Yeah. That we know of. Um, but Dr. Simon Jordan, really good character. Yes. It was a good added character. That was so, it's such a cool, we're kind of viewing the story through his perspective almost. Yes. And just to be clear, he wasn't like, he's not a real person. He was a fictional. I thought you were going to say he wasn't a real doctor. And I was like, really? <laughs> well, yeah, he definitely wasn't a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> not real. Um, and Margaret Atwood, she, when she's talked about the book, she says she did her very best to paint an accurate picture of life in the 19th century. She tried really hard not to put any sort of modern ideals into the characters and Good. opinions. Yeah. Um, she said because she did so much re- research on Canada in the 19th century, she considers herself like a minor expert on the subject now. <laughs> That's kind of awesome. Yeah. She said she especially did research into what it was like to be a domestic worker at the time, because that's what Grace was, what spiritualism was like at the time. Do you remember yes. spiritualism? We did do an episode on that, but the time frame was a little bit different. I know we, we focus more on the late 19th century. Mm-hmm. And um, the psychology of quilt making, which is a big, big theme in the book and the show that yes. we're not going to get into because right. you got to watch it. Yeah. Don't be lazy. It's on Netflix. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's a mini series and that came out in 2017. And the fact that this came out just was like a third sort of iteration of people being fascinated by this story, including myself. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is interesting how we find stories like generation after generation. And then it's almost like we become enamored with them once again. And it's just like the cyclical cycle of humanity. Yeah. Cause here for Grace Marks, we have the original case, right? Right. The trial, the newspapers, everyone's going crazy trying to figure out, did this young girl kill these people? And then we have Moody's books and articles once Grace is in the insane asylum yes. that reinvigorate the sort of question of like, what's going on here? It was also really popular at the time to put prisoners into mental institutions. And it was actually seen as a more humane and progressive approach. But those institutions were extremely, extremely traumatic. Yeah, like they weren't like the... They're not therapeutic. Right. Um, A lot of physical and sexual abuse happened. So it's like, oh, okay, you're almost going to make things worse. Exactly. Cool, 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 cool. So it was seen as a good thing, but it definitely was not. Um, And then, of course, we have 
1996 novel and then we have the Netflix show and we're just going to keep falling in love with this story. Yeah, I'm sure like our kids or grandkids at some point will relearn about this and be Mm -hmm. like, oh my God. Yeah, the case continues to fascinate us. It raises a lot of questions about gender, class, historical accounts. Like, how do you know who's reliable and who's not? Yeah, that's the craziest thing about history in general, right? Is like Mm -hmm. looking at the different accounts and analyzing them and seeing like, okay, like where are they cross-referencing each other, right? Like where they're just relying on like a previous author, right? Mm -hmm. Where do like contemporary authors differ in their accounts, if at all, Yes. right? And then kind of like trying to like find that line, especially like in ancient history. I mean, if you find two sources of the same event, like that's, that's amazing. That's huge. That's yeah. huge. So usually you have to rely on one and it's like, it's ancient. Like I love Herodotus, but he's like, you know, he, when he says some stuff up, yeah. When he says that there were like a, a million or 10 million, it's some absurd number of like Persians that invaded Greece. You're like, no, that's, that's not right. Like it probably was like hundreds of thousands, but it wasn't a million plus. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, in a very different scale, what's going on with this case is like, yes, exactly. Because it's already so scandalous. People are adding on things later to make it even more scandalous, you know? Yeah. So it's hard to tell what was real and what wasn't. And I think the fact that we may and very well likely never know what actually happened that night in the Kinnear residence. I think that's what keeps bringing us back to this story. Yeah. It's, I, I, I have, well, do you have any, um, any like inkling as to like what truly happened? I'm so biased. I'm so, so biased. I, you think Grace Marks is completely innocent? Yeah. Or I want mostly innocent. I want to believe her that she didn't do anything to stop it, but she also didn't have a lot of power to do anything to stop it. Yeah. And she just was kind of roped into this psycho's plan yeah I do. I, that's just what i want to believe um but that could just be me being biased and wanting that to be the truth yeah well that's good that you're like you're talking about your biases like in in this regard um who do you think i think it's some. i think it's somewhere in the middle mm. i think i i definitely think she maybe egged him on I don't Ooh. think she's the mastermind. I don't. I think that's too far. But I do think she egged him on. Yeah. And I think he is exaggerating that. Yeah. To try to reduce blame on himself. But he's still... It's like, bro, you're, you're still like... Because I think he was older. He is. You're still the one who carried it out and you were listening to a child. Yeah. Like, your, your sister is 16. I would not oh, listen yeah. to your six sister and tell uh, listen to her like tell me to kill someone and then actually do it you know it's that's like pretty good i'm glad i'm glad to know that. right <laughs> yeah i mean i feel like that's kind of freaking obvious mm-hmm. but um you know at the same time i i guess you know he is also more of her contemporary right he's like 22 like, yeah he's like in his early 20s i'm in my early 30s so i have a, a little bit more life, life experience, experience yeah. yeah uh but at the same time it's like their prefrontal lobes are squishy i yes. will say that for both of them, not really thinking things through and thinking about consequences is very common for both of their ages. These are people who both probably would have been really traumatized and really poor and desperate. So mm-hmm. I do think you're right. They could have sort of egged each other on yeah. a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And I think the and truth And it got is, out of hand. Exactly. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah. But that's a really good way of putting it. We will never know. We'll never know, weirdos. (laughs) (laughs) And that is the mysterious case of Grace Marks, aka Alias Grace. You know what? And I'm glad you told the story uh, because there are some big differences that in the show versus like what actually you know what we what know we know actually happened, happened. Yeah. yeah so i'm glad that you were able to tell the story um but i still definitely recommend watching if you haven't already watching that that show because they do do quite a good job exploring the different possibilities which is what they do yeah. they don't tell you like a single story that's true they explore the different possibilities of what could have happened is so satisfying to your brain it is. It's like, oh, I could totally see that happening. Yeah. For like all of them. Um, definitely recommend. Definitely. Definitely. It's a show I'll probably rewatch because I'm weird like that. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, weirdos, thank you so much for listening. Again, this is our last episode of 2024 before our hiatus. We, I personally just wanted to thank you guys so much for listening to all of our episodes yeah. over, I mean, like the last three years, but really like the last, since 2020, when we first launched History for Weirdos, you guys have made this community so special. And I don't want you to think for a second that this is because of you guys. This is because like we have full-time jobs mm -hmm. and and we're doing this and we are, it, you we're know, tired. you get to a point where you're just tired and I like, I'm exhausted. I'm not, I don't look it right now, but I'm deep down. I'm very exhausted. Yeah. I think that's really well said. Um, you can love something and you could still get tired and need to take a break and that's okay. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully this serves as a reminder to you weirdos that it's okay to take a break. It's okay to take a break even from things you love sometimes. Yeah. All right, weirdos. Until well, next time. Until next time, weirdos. Adios. Adios, Adios for now.